Chapter 6 The Buttress of the Reformed Case Covenant Theology As I've explained, the law, say Reformed teachers, is binding on all men and has been so since God gave it to Adam. In particular, it's binding on believers now, not for justification, of course, but as the perfect rule of their sanctification. The Reformed go further. It's the motive, the spur, the force, the driving power behind that sanctification. That is the Reformed claim. What is the buttress for it? What underpins their position on the law? It is something they call covenant theology. What is this? And what underpins covenant theology? As I set out to answer these questions, let me offer both an explanation and an apology. You will find what follows complicated, muddled, confused, even contradictory, even more so than Calvin's threefold use of the law. I apologize for this, but there's little I can do about it. No matter how hard I try to make the Reformed theology for their claims on the law easy to follow, I am faced with an impossible task, and this because of the very nature of the arguments which they use. The confusion and contradiction is not of my making, it's theirs. And this will be even more apparent if you read their original works. See, for instance, the quote from Boston in the previous chapter. In light of the complicated reform logic, may I remind you of something I said at the start. Without in any way intending to patronize, if you find this chapter too much, on a first hearing you will sustain little loss by skipping to the next. The fact is, since they themselves are unable to sort it out, no wonder I cannot unravel the reformed law. The fact is, since they themselves are unable to sort it out, no wonder I cannot unravel the reformed tangle. But I fear that this might well make some hearers give up and put my audio book down. I trust not. Having got this far, may I hope your interest having been sufficiently aroused, you might be prepared to grapple with the human illogic you find in this chapter, and stay with me long enough to move on from the foggy speculations of men into the clear light of Scripture. But taking Paul as our example, just as he knew that he had to tackle the faulty theology of the Judaizers of his day, we have no choice. We, too, have to expose the fault lines in Reformed Covenant theology today. Even so, since that theology is so complicated, it will inevitably prove rather a tortuous experience. You have been warned. So, to start at the end and work backwards, covenant theology is the buttress of the reform view of the law. But what underpins covenant theology? This can be discovered by answering another question, a question of immense importance. Are the two testaments continuous or discontinuous? To put it another way, is every part of the Bible of equal weight and importance? Do not be frightened by such questions. I am not for a moment suggesting that the Bible, all of it, is not equally inspired. It is. The entire Bible is the word of God, from Genesis to Revelation, including both. Nevertheless, the question must be asked and answered. Does every verse of Scripture have the same weight in the life of the believer today? Are the two testaments continuous or discontinuous? God did not reveal his word all at once. Not only did he spread that revelation over hundreds of years, but he gave us his word in two testaments. How are these testaments related to one another? How should believers use them in formulating doctrine and practice? 
Do they draw principles equally from both? Or from the New Testament only? Or what? This is what I mean by asking if the Testaments are continuous or discontinuous. It's dangerously simplistic, of course, to polarize such an important debate in this way, as though it must be one or the other. The Testaments are neither continuous nor discontinuous. They are both. The proper way to read the Testaments is to grasp their unity in their discontinuity. Christ is that unity. The all pointed to him, revealing him in prophecies and shadows. The new reveals him as the fulfiller of those prophecies, the reality of the shadows. As a consequence, when we read the Bible, we should be looking for Christ and reading everything through Christ, whose person and work is the unifying factor of Scripture. Granting that, the debate, therefore, really hinges on where the emphasis should fall. Should it be on the continuity? or the discontinuity. There is no doubt, or shouldn't be, discontinuity. We have abundant scriptural evidence for emphasizing the discontinuity of the Testament. For now, just take one place, just one, Romans three twenty to 22 Note the vital, but now. The passage reads, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe. These verses show at once the difference between the two Testaments that is, the discontinuity between them. But at the same time, they show their continuity. As for the discontinuity, nothing could be plainer. The ages of law and grace are very different ages because law and grace are very different systems. As for the continuity, grace was foretold and prefigured by the law and the prophets. But the emphasis on this passage As for the continuity, grace was foretold and prefigured by the law and the prophets, but the emphasis of this passage in particular, and the New Testament in general, comes down firmly on the side of the discontinuity. I'm not, of course, for a moment suggesting that there was no grace in the Old Testament, and that no sinner was saved in those days. Now, the fact remains, there is a discontinuity between the Testaments, and that is where the weight falls. Note the contrast. Note the time factor. Now Christ has come. Now we are not under the law. The coming of Christ and our coming to him in repentance and faith has altered everything. In the former case, historically speaking. In the latter, in a personal sense. Because of the but now, all things are new. The coming of Christ is the great turning point, the momentous watershed of history, and the contrast between this age and the old age is written large across the pages of Scripture. And this does. And this discontinuity must be emphasized. While Paul in Romans 3, 20-22 was safeguarding the continuity between the two Testaments. This was not his primary purpose, far from it. Rather, he was setting out the discontinuity between the two. And it's this discontinuity which is of far greater importance than the continuity. Believers ought to recognize and rejoice in the differences between the two Testaments, the changes brought about by the eschatological but now. After all, their hope depends absolutely on the differences. In speaking of the discontinuity of the two Testaments, I have, in fact, been speaking of the differences between two ages, two systems, two covenants, especially this last. 
the discontinuity between the old and new covenant. Scripture puts the weight on the newness of the new covenant. And when it says new, it does not mean something which was old, but is now renewed or amended. It really does mean a new covenant, accentuating the distinction between the age of the law and the age of the Spirit. Although it's an oversimplification, to put it like this, in moving from the age of the Old Testament to the age of the New, there was a fundamental change of covenant. The Old gave way to the New, Hebrew 7, 8, 9, 10, 12. This, as I've said, is an oversimplification. We know that some people in the Old Testament belong to the New Covenant, and that the believers under the Old Covenant were looking forward to Christ. Some sinners were justified in the Old Testament, but the doctrine itself was not written so clearly as in the New. This would be... This would seem to be stating the obvious. If not, why do we have the New Testament? The position of Old Testament believers was anomalous. They were in the New Covenant and therefore delighted in God's law, Psalm 119. But at the same time, they were under its burden in the Old Covenant. But the basic truth stands. There was a fundamental change of covenant with the change of testament. It didn't take place at the first verse of Matthew, of course. It came into effect with the death of Christ, or more particularly, with the glorification of Christ in his resurrection and the gift of the Spirit. A definite and irreversible change of covenant took place through Christ. And here is the nub of the debate. Many Reformed people do not accept this discontinuity, or at least its emphasis. They read their Bibles through very different spectacles. Very different. It was a, perhaps the, bone of contention between the Anabaptists and the Reformers at the very heart of their disagreement. The Anabaptists rightly put the differences between the Old and the New Covenants and the consequent distinction between the Testaments at the centre of the debate. The Reformers, on the other hand, stressing the continuity of the two Testaments, were confused over the two great biblical covenants, often arguing for their oneness, and much of their practical theology flowed from it. Rejecting human logic, the Anabaptist rule of faith and practice was the Bible alone, especially the New Testament. God has revealed himself in the Bible in a progressive way, they said. The Old Testament is not on a parity with the New. The new covenant is supreme. Believers are not the children of the Old Testament or covenant, but of the new. The weapons of their warfare are of the new, not the old. Arguing out these principles, they stress the differences in the two ages. Believers, they argued, are under the authority of the, of the Old Testament, but only as far as it testifies of Christ, only insofar as he did not abolish it, and only in so far as it serves the purpose of Christian living. In short, believers are under the authority of the law in so far as it does not contradict the gospel. In this way, they distinct In this way, they distinguished between the testaments. In about fifteen forty four, for instance, Pilgrim Marpeck produced a massive book of more than 800 pages contrasting the two testaments on many topics, including forgiveness, rest, faith, sword, offerings, etc. The Old Testament, the Anabaptists argued, was temporary. The new, abiding. The old is symbol. The new, fulfillment. The old was preparatory and partial. The new is final and complete. The old speaks of Adam, sin, death, and law. The new speaks of Christ and redemption through him. 
all scripture must be interpreted Christologically. That is, it must be seen in him and through him and his work. If the Old Testament is given the wrong place or status in church and theology, all sorts of dire consequences follow, as could be seen in both Munster and Geneva. Yes, both. Such were the views of most Anabaptists. A few did not see it entirely this way, however. Some were Sabbatarians who sought to apply Old Testament laws to believers. The Reformers, on the other hand, The Reformers, on the other hand, propounding a continuous history encompassing one age since the covenant with Abraham, saw only minor differences between the two testaments, arising out of their time sequence. The Reformers saw no difference in substance between the testaments. As a result, they responded bitterly to the Anabaptists not giving sufficient weight to the relevant passages in Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews, they made the mistake of saying, when it suited them, that the Testaments were continuous and not discontinuous, and viewed the Bible as a flat revelation, with every passage having the same authority, regardless of its place in the Bible. Thus Israel and the Church became one, and the government of Israel was made to serve as a guide for the state church in the 16th century. Here were two distinct approaches to Scripture, still with us. Not all go as far as those Reconstructionists who talk of the older and not the Old Testament, but those who come down on the continuity side talk about the Jewish church as an infant form of the Gospel church. Further, they base infant baptism on Jewish circumcision and so on. All this has large and dire consequences. To cope with it, you need to be nimble in sorting out the logic and language of covenant theology, the double covenant, the external and the internal covenant, the elect and the church seed, the visible godly, federal faithfulness, and so on. Having done that, you will have to come to terms with church members who are acknowledged to be profane and chaffy hypocrites, but nevertheless remain glass-eyed ornaments to the church, and so on. So how do the Reformed cope with the biblical evidence? As I've said, here we reach the heart of the debate. Many Reformed people do not act Many Reformed people do not accept the clear discontinuity, or at least deny its emphasis. When they read their Bibles, they look down the wrong end of the telescope, viewing the New Testament through the Old. All sorts of troubles follow. In particular, how does it affect their interpretation of Romans three twenty-one to 22 Some think that the words but now signal a mere change of paragraph or simply a small matter of timing. They do not. To, enfeeb to enfeeble the but now in such a way is tragic. The but and the now must be emphasized. The but as a contrast, and the now in its historical sense. And it's far more than mere history, as I have said. Paul was speaking of the great Ascat Paul was speaking of the great eschatological now, the time of the new epoch, the but now of the new era, the time of the gospel instead of the law, the age of the realm of the spirit. Paul was speaking of the great eschatological now, the time of the new epoch, the but now of the new era, the time of the gospel instead of the law, the age of the gospel contrasted with the age of the law, the age and realm of the spirit and not law, the age of faith and not works. No wonder these two words but now have been justly called the most wonderful words in the entire Bible. Lloyd-Jones, for one, did. 
quite right to. As poor thundered elsewhere, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now, but now. If anybody should try to dismiss this by saying, I am making a mountain out of a molehill of one passage, in addition to Romans 3.21, he ought to weigh Romans 5, verses 9 and 11, 6.22, 7, 6, 8, 1, 11, 30, 11, 31, 16, 26, along with John 15, Acts 17, 1 Corinthians 15, Galatians 4, Ephesians 2, Ephesians 5, Colossians 1, Hebrews 8, 9, 12, and 1 Peter 2. Note the contrast between the two ages, the two systems in Romans 4, 13 to 17. The promise to Abraham was not through the law, but through faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of no effect, because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. Paul's argument collapses if law is not contrasted with grace and faith. This would seem to be obvious. Sadly, not all can see it. On justification, the reformers were clear about the distinction between law and gospel, but otherwise they were confused about the two. While they rightly forsook the legal ground for justification, they kept to it for sanctification. And where we find this muddle, we find believers who are virtual Mosaeans instead of Christian. In their covenant theology, overemphasizing the continuity as they do, they fail to do justice to the revealed discontinuity of the two covenants. This I will prove first by glancing at the biblical teaching on the covenants, and then trying to set out the arguments used by Reformed covenant theologians. In all this, a nice point of translation from the Greek arises. Should we be talking about covenant or testament? Almost certainly the former. Testaments should have been called the old and new covenants. And in the text itself, Covenant should have almost always have been used instead of testament, since it would have more truly conveyed the almost universal meaning of the word to readers of the English Bible. And this in itself might well have prevented much of the trouble addressed in this chapter. Biblical Teaching on the Covenants 1. The Covenant Within the Godhead let me start with Scripture, and let me begin at the beginning where I and the Reformed writers are agreed. In eternity past, the triune God determined and decreed to save the elect. This is written large in Scripture. For instance, Paul said he was a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledgement of the truth, which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began, but has in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of God our Saviour, Titus chapter 1. Since God promised before time began, he could not have promised to any created being. Therefore he must have promised to himself within the Godhead. In other words, because of his sovereign grace, love, and will, all within himself God agreed within the Godhead to save his elect through his Son, Jesus Christ, by the effectual working of his Holy Spirit. I am willing to call this a covenant, the covenant of grace, no less, except this term is not used in Scripture, but is an invention of covenant theologians. Not only that, their use of the term is far more complicated 
than the way in which I would want to use it. Leaving that aside, as I say, throughout the word of God, there is abundant evidence of this agreement within the Godhead. But since I and Reformed writers are of one mind on this, except on the use of the phrase that one But since I and Reformed writers are of one mind on this, except on the use of the phrase, the covenant of grace, I will say a little more on it. But since I and Reformed writers are of one mind on this, except on the use of the phrase, the covenant of grace, I will say a little more on it. This determination, compact agreement, or promise within the Godhead is not at issue here. It has nothing to do with man. It's an agreement, a decree, a promise within the Godhead. It has nothing to do with the question of the believer and the law. If this was all that covenant theology amounted to, I would have no quarrel with it. But it isn't, and I do. To move on. The need for salvation arose out of Adam's fall. Through Adam, sin entered the world, and at through Adam, sin entered the world, and in Adam all the human race sinned and fell. In accordance with God's own determination within the Godhead, at the right time Christ came into the world and earn salvation for all his elect, as in Adam all die. All in Adam die, and all in Christ live. In all this, I am sure, there is no difference between me and the Reform. Biblical Teaching on the Covenant 2. God's covenants with men. Down the ages, God has made various covenants with men. He made the covenant with Noah, with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob, with Israel at Sinai, with Phinehas, with David, and so on. He also made a covenant which he calls the New Covenant. Biblical Teaching on the Covenant 3. The Two Great Covenants with Men The two great covenants which God has made with men are the Mosaic Covenant and the New Covenant. In saying this, I do not dismiss the Abrahamic Covenant, certainly not. The fact is, that covenant had two strands to it. One concerned Abraham's physical seed, Israel the other his spiritual seed, the church. The first strand was encompassed in the Mosaic Covenant, the second in the New Covenant. So, as I say, the two great scriptural covenants are the Mosaic Covenant and the New Covenant. The Mosaic Law is called the Old or First Covenant. This includes, but is not confined to, the Ten Commandments. Those Ten Commandments being delineated as the words of the covenant, and God wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So God declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone. The Ten Commandments constituted God's covenant given on Sinai. But the fact is, the old covenant was all the law, and not merely the Ten Commandments. To despise any of God's statutes, to abhor any of his judgments, to fail to perform all his commandments was to break his covenant. Leviticus 26. The book of the covenant contained all the words of the Lord, all his judgments or ordinances, commandments, testimonies, and statutes. An abundance of scripture demonstrates that. So the first or old covenant is the law the law of Moses. What is the second or new covenant? 
It is grace in Christ, the gospel, the book of Hebrews. Now, we are expressly told that Christ removed the old covenant that he might set up the new. He brought in the time of reformation, Hebrews 9, the time of the new order. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second, Hebrews 10, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, Ephesians 2, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, Colossians 2. Having annulled the former commandment because of his weakness and unprofitableness, he brought in a better hope through which we draw near to God, Hebrews 7. Christ is a mediator. Christ is mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. He is made the first obsolete. Hebrews 8. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. John 1. These are the two covenants which lie at the heart of this debate. While there is some continuity between the old covenant and the new, the Bible speaks of vast differences between them. The old was temporary. It was a ministry of death and condemnation and was introduced with blackness and darkness and tempest so that they could not endure what was commanded. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. The new covenant, however, is permanent. The ministry of life, of the spirit, of righteousness. But you have come to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. In short, the old required man's obedience. The new is God's promise. The old was external ritual and ceremonial. The new, inward and spiritual. The old was ruled by fear. The new, by love. The old was bondage, slavery to law and works. The new, freedom, liberty in Christ. The old was for the Jew. The new, for the elect throughout the world. The old said, stay away. The new says, come. The old was breakable and was broken by every man under it except Christ. The new is unbreakable. This, in brief, is the biblical doctrine on the covenants. As I've noted, some Reformed teachers disagree with what I have said about the two great covenants. But this is only the tip of the iceberg. Covenant theology, I contend, diverges markedly from Scripture, being a logical system invented by men and imposed on Scripture. But since it underpins the Reformed view of the law, we must look at it and try to get to grips with it. A word of warning, however, is like wrestling in a fog with an octopus which has been liberally smeared in Vaseline. Covenant Theology 1. The Covenant of Works and the Covenant of Grace What is the Reformed idea of a covenant? They say it's an agreement between two or more parties, whether or not the parties are equal. Covenant theologians say God made a covenant with Adam. But where are we told this in Scripture? They go on to say God made a covenant with all men in Adam. Where are we told this in Scripture? Further, they give this so-called covenant a name, a name which looms large in their writings, namely, the covenant of works. But you will not find this in Scripture. I am not being silly or pedantic. I am well aware that the word Trinity does not appear in the Bible. For the moment, I am simply stating a fact. The covenant of works does not appear in Scripture as a term. My contention is, of course, 
neither does it appear as a concept. As I've already mentioned, the law As I've already mentioned, the Reform have also invented another covenant, the covenant of grace, which is far more complicated than the covenant of works, which is problematical enough. So I will leave further explanation of it until we come across it, just to say this covenant of grace, as covenant theologians have developed it, does not appear in Scripture either, either in name or concept. What's more, it's impossible to speak of the Reformed idea of the covenant of grace. The simple fact is, covenant theologians don't see eye to eye with each other on what this so-called covenant of grace is. Let me summarize so far. Most Reformed writers argue on the basis of a logical system they have invented, covenant theology. And in the process, they have coined two phrases the covenant of works, and the covenant of grace. These phrases and the principles behind them are fundamental, pivotal to covenant theology and are, so it said, the heart of Calvinism. Sadly, this logical contrivance, the covenant of works and the covenant of grace, invented by Reformed theologians dominating their theology, has greatly complicated the simplicity of the Bible and muddied the waters dreadfully. Things have got worse in the past 500 years as covenant theologians have continued to elaborate and embellish their system, piling confusion upon confusion. I remind you, the Bible speaks of two covenants, the Mosaic and the New. Notice how the Bible and covenant theology are beginning to diverge already. They sound similar. They sound similar. Both are based on two covenants, but they're very different covenants. Covenant theology 2. The Covenant of Grace. Since it's the so-called covenant of works which has most bearing on my book, I will only say a few words about the so-called covenant of grace. As I hinted, Reformed teachers are themselves far from clear about it which some will admit to. They are not sure, for instance, about who is in the covenant of grace. Some think even the unregenerate may be in it. Some think there is not but one. Some think there is not one but two covenants of grace, one called the covenant of redemption, to distinguish it from the covenant of grace. It makes one wonder, as one of their most influential teachers recognized in print, why ever the notion of the covenant of grace caught on. Other problems exist. In addition to who is the second party of the covenant, is the covenant conditional or unconditional? Is it internal or external? What about the difference between the essence and the administration of the covenant? Is it uh, an absolute covenant? Is it a legal question, or does it involve life? These are not my questions, I hasten to add. I have culled them from Louis Burkhoff's Systematic Theology, widely distributed over several decades by the Banner of Truth Trust. All such questions have perplexed Reformed theologians for centuries, and still do. But they are of their own making. And what about the covenant of redemption, which I mentioned in passing a moment ago? What is this? What about the problems Reformed logicians love to invent and try to solve concerning this covenant? Problems such as, on what basis do some Reformed theologians speak of a covenant between the Father and the Son with no place for the Holy Spirit? Is this non-Trinitarian covenant a threat to the doctrine of the Trinity or not? Or is it a Trinitarian covenant after all, even though it doesn't look like it? What is the connection between the covenant of redemption and the covenant of grace? Are they different or one and the same? These two are questions of their own making. 
Reformed teachers might try to say that their terminology need not confuse us. But the fact is, they are themselves confused and divided. They may say it all can be put simply, but experience proves otherwise. Leading Reformed theologians disagree among themselves, saying they cannot understand each other's scheme. So what hopes for the average believer under Reformed teachers? The truth is, covenant theology solves nothing. Although those who started it wanted to avoid scholastic definitions, that's where it's ended up, openly ambiguous. The supreme problem for covenant theologians, however, does not concern the so-called covenant of grace. No, the main problem is with what they call the covenant of works. The great question is, was the Mosaic covenant, the one I'm concerned with in this book, the covenant of grace or the covenant of works? Opinions are sharply divided, self-contradictory, and at best muddled among Reformed teachers. They might wonder why covenant theology is not caught on outside their own circle, but the answer would seem self-evident. Covenant Theology 3 The Biblical Covenants, Covenant Theologians Claim, are one and the same covenant. It is at this point that we run into massive trouble, as I said, Reformed teachers say that the various covenants in Scripture are really one and the same, just different administrations of the one covenant of grace. In particular, the Mosaic covenant was essentially the same as that covenant which was established with Abraham. Judged by Scripture, the suggestion that all the covenants are one and the same is incredible. For one thing, the word covenant really speaks of discontinuity a change, something different. So whatever covenant theology deals with, it must deal with change. For the priesthood being changed, of necessity there is also a change of the law. Don't miss the necessity. Do not miss the of necessity. Take the covenants reformed teachers try to synthesize. Genesis 3.15 was a promise, not a covenant at all. The covenant with Noah was a covenant with all mankind. The covenant with Abraham, as I've explained, had two aspects, one applicable to his physical descendants and the other to his spiritual descendants. The Mosaic covenant as Sinai was a covenant of law works, which concerned Israel. The new covenant concerns believers. And there were other covenants down the ages besides these. One would think, judging by Reformed writers, that Paul spoke of the covenant singular in both Romans 9.4 and Ephesians 2.12. He did not. Take the latter. He spoke of the covenants of promise. Note the plural. The Bible makes much of an S on the end of a word. Galatians 3.16 but many reform writers claim that the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, and the new covenant are virtually one and the same, and all are covenants of grace and not works. This is staggering. If the covenant of Sinai did not demand law works, what did it demand? I will have much more to say about this. Then again, how can references to the Abrahamic covenant the Mosaic Covenant, and the New Covenant, all apply to the Covenant. After all, the Jeremiah passage could not be plainer. The New Covenant is the New Covenant, and is expressly said to be not according to the Mosaic Covenant. These two at least cannot be the same covenant, can they? Let me stress once again the newness of the New Covenant. Christians are under the New Covenant, that covenant which is expressly said to be unlike the Mosaic covenant, the old covenant. Yet Calvin accused the Anabaptists of madness for what he dismissed as the pestilential error of questioning the oneness of the covenant.
are we not plainly told that the old covenant has been abolished and the new has come? The believers are not under the law. See Romans 6, 14 to 15, 7, 1 to 6, 8, 2 to 11, 2 Corinthians 3, 7 to 11, and so on. Hebrews 7, 8, 9, and 10. We know that the Mosaic covenant has been abolished. 2 Corinthians 3. What is more, as the old covenant was abolished, and the new covenant came, in a comparison, even a stark contrast was drawn between the two. Far from being altogether one and the same covenant, they are very, very different. How different can be easily seen in Paul's words. God made us ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, was glorious, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry... <coughs> For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. 2 Corinthians 3. This is vital. The Bible contrasts the two covenants, the old and the new, and contrasts them very sharply indeed. In the following quotations, please observe the use of the words but yet and on the other hand. These are words of contrast, powerful words, words which must not be glossed. Nor should we miss the apostles' hyperbole. Glorious, glory, more glorious, glory, exceeds much more in glory. Glorious, glory, the glory that excels, glorious, more glorious. And on which covenant does the weight of glory resoundingly fall? The two covenants are clearly contrasted in the following passages. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. You were not under law, but under grace. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is every one who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. For these are two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar, for this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Earth. For these are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free. For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. But now, he's obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on 
better promises. But if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Are these quotations not sufficient to prove that the old and new covenants are very different? Do they not show that the new is far superior to the old, and plainly so? How can they be the same? If they are, how could Paul say, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Here we have it. Two laws, two systems, two economies, two covenants. The old, the law of sin and death. The new, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. The contrast, I say again, could not be greater. The old was a covenant of death. The new is a covenant of life. There is no greater contrast than between death and life. No wonder we are told, in that God says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete, and that Christ has taken away the first that he may establish the second. Some reform teachers censure those of us who dare assert that the old covenant is abolished, but the letter to the Hebrew says it is. Christ draws a very clear contrast between the old and the new covenants in Mark 2, illustrating this in two ways. It is futile both to sew a piece of new cloth onto an old garment and to put new wine into old wineskins. The two covenants are very different. They cannot be cobbled together. Although covenant theologians claim the covenants, the Abrahamic, the Mosaic, and the New, the last two in particular, are one covenant. They are mistaken. Covenant Theology 4. The Covenant of Works But what of the Reformed Covenant of Works? Though its advocates have to admit its development is Though its advocates have to admit its development is something of a mystery, the, the, though its advocates have to admit its development is something of a mystery, those of us who reject the concept are dismissed as thinking unbiblically. This, of course, needs proof, not mere assertion. Advocates of the covenant of works aware of the need to be clear about its biblical basis, have to admit its name cannot be found in the first three chapters of Genesis. But why worry about the non-mention of its name? There are bigger problems with it than that. Neither the name nor the concept itself is found in the entire Bible. Even so, the lack of the term, while this I freely concede is not conclusive, should give pause for thought. Yes, if the principle can be found in Scripture, the absence of his name is not important. But is the principle in Scripture? This is the question. Romans 5, 12 to 21, so it seems, is the only passage which at first glance can be used to establish the covenant of works the covenant said to be made with all the human race in Adam. If this is right, and Romans 5, 12 to 21 does speak of the covenant of works, it can only mean that the law is not this covenant of works. Since John 1, 17, Romans 5, 13 to 14, and Galatians 3, 10 to 29 teach that the law was not given to men until Sinai, 430 years after Abraham, let alone Adam. It could not, therefore, have been given to Adam and the patriarchs. This, in turn, can only mean that the law is the covenant of grace, which, as I will show, is nonsense. So what about Romans 5, 12 to 21? As I have made clear, I fully accept, I am convinced biblically, 
that in eternity past the triune God agreed to save the elect in Christ. I am also convinced that in Adam all the human race fell into sin. Both Adam and Christ acted as representative heads, acting for all their descendants. That is, in Adam all the human race, in Christ all the elect. Adam fell, all the human race fell in and with him. Christ was born under the law, kept the law, died under the law, and was raised from the dead. All the elect are constituted and accounted righteous by God in him, receiving all the benefits he earned for them by his life, sufferings, and resurrection. I find these truths unmistakably taught in Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15. But this is a far cry from the covenant theology invented by Reformed scholars. If truth be told, not all of them accept the usual deductions made by covenant theologians from the passages. Romans 7.10 is another passage which is sometimes called on to justify the covenant of works. But this verse, according to the immediate context, clearly speaks of the Ten Commandments in truth the law, which on Sinai had been addressed to Jews, all of them But this verse, according to the immediate context, clearly speaks of the Ten Commandments, in truth the law, which, on Sinai, had been addressed to Jews, all of whom, naturally, were sinners. Even so, some Reformed writers claim that, in Romans 7.10, Paul was speaking of the covenant of works, given to Adam before he fell. In other words, the law was given to a man who had not sinned. Allowing it to be so for the moment, what Adam made of prohibitions against murder and adultery, and so on before he had sinned, I simply cannot comprehend. And what of 1 Timothy 1 9? The law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers. In which of these categories did Adam find himself before he fell? The main confusion concerning the Reformed Covenant of Works can be seen The main confusion concerning the Reformed Covenant of Works, as can be seen, arises over the Mosaic Covenant. Was the Mosaic Covenant the Covenant of Works, or was it the Covenant of Grace? I mean, of course, in Reformed terms. The Bible knows nothing of either. But this is a fundamental question for covenant theology. Was Sinai a Works Covenant or a Grace Covenant? Covenant theologians ought to be able to give us a clear, unequivocal answer to that question. Can they? Will they? The Bible does. Let me prove it. Covenant Theology 5. Sinai, was it a works covenant? Or a grace covenant? Take Galatians 4, 21-31. In the allegory of Sarah and Hagar, we are expressly told that the law on Mount Sinai was a covenant of bondage, in contrast to another covenant, the two women representing these two covenants. What covenant did Sarah represent? The answer is patent. The Abrahamic covenant fulfilled in the new covenant. How do we know? Well, how would the Galatians have understood Paul's allusion? not having the benefit of 2 Corinthians 3 or Hebrews 8, and limited to what they knew from the apostles' letter they were reading or having read to them, nevertheless their minds would have leapt to the covenant with Abraham, and for two reasons. First, Paul had already stressed the Abrahamic covenant of promise, Galatians 3. 
Secondly, the allegory itself contains the explicit reference to Abraham, Hagar, and Isaac, and the implied reference to Sarah. Paul, in referring to Sarah, was speaking of the Abrahamic covenant, fulfilled in the new. That is how the Galatians would have read the apostle. That is how we must read him. Now, whatever view is taken of the covenant represented by Sarah, the covenant represented by Hagar is the law, the Mosaic covenant. Paul was writing to those who desired to be under the law. The allegory spoke of two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is or represents Mount Sinai and corresponds to bondage. This covenant is expressly called a covenant of bondage. In other words, it was a works covenant, which no sinner could keep, but which enslaved those under it. Note further, contrast was Paul's theme. Contrast between law, bondage, and flesh in the one covenant, and promise, freedom, and the spirit in the other. Paul's argument was directed against the Judaizers, who wanted believers to go under the Mosaic Covenant. Indeed, as I've shown, they argued that the Abrahamic and the Mosaic Covenants were one and the same. Not for a moment would he countenance the thought. The Mosaic Covenant, being a covenant of bondage, Paul would have none of it. This puts covenant theologians on the side of the Judaizers, and therefore against Paul. Let me prove it. Many Reformed writers, as I've said, will not have it at any price. In one respect, they have the same faulty theology as the Judaizers. Flying in the face of Scripture, they say there are not two covenants here in Galatians 4, but one. The two women do not represent two covenants, but two aspects of one covenant. The two women do not represent two covenants, but two aspects of one covenant. The slavery of the Mosaic covenant was not really a part of that covenant at all. It was all a misunderstanding, a Jewish misinterpretation of the covenant. So it is clear. But Paul said no such thing. He said it was the covenant itself which enslaved. It was no misunderstanding. The Mosaic Covenant was based on a slavish principle, do and live, with its corollary, fail and die. Those under it, the Jews, were held prisoners by the law, locked up by it, Galatians 3. The law could bring life, yes, but the obedience had to be perfect. Now, since all men, apart from Christ, are sinners, no man can be saved by law. If he could, if righteousness comes through the law, that is, through a sinner keeping the law, then Christ died in vain. But no sinner can be saved by law. The fault, however, is not with the law. For the law is perfect, good, holy and just and good. The fault is with man. If there had been a law given which could have given life, Truly, righteousness would have been by the law of God. The law itself was a works covenant. It was not a case of the Jews turning a grace covenant into a works covenant. Even so, many Reformed teachers continued to insist the law was a, indeed, the covenant of grace. To confuse the Mosaic covenant, with the covenant of works, to deny to confuse the Mosaic covenant with the covenant of works, to deny it is the covenant of grace, is, so it's alleged, the most common error in interpreting the allegory. The first covenant and old covenant are said to refer not to the Mosaic covenant but to the whole age between Adam's fall and Christ's first coming. 
the Mosaic Covenant and Abrahamic Covenant being one and the same. This is quite wrong. In Galatians 4, 21 to 25, Paul was speaking of two covenants, the old and the new within the Abrahamic covenant. Those under the law are slaves. Those under grace are saints. The two covenants and those under them are chalk and cheese. These two covenants cannot be the same covenant. 2 Corinthians 3, Galatians 3, and many other places utterly refuted. In fact, Reformed theologians themselves, deep down, despite their seemingly confident assertions, have a real problem, a massive problem, an intractable problem, with the Mosaic Covenant, and are guilty of doublespeak. Some admit the Mosaic Covenant certainly looks as though it's the covenant of works, but even so they claim it is, after all, the covenant of grace. But the law didn't merely look like the law, it was the law. The word of God says so. Other Reformed teachers say the law was the covenant of grace more legally defined at Sinai. But how can grace be legally defined, let alone more legally defined? Another writer wants it both ways. The law was the covenant of works, a modified version of the Abrahamic covenant, but also a renewal of the single covenant of grace spanning all time from Adam to the eternal state to come. Grace, law, gospel, and curse all jumbled together. It seems some grace. Grace, law, gospel, and curse all jumbled together, it seems. Some grace, some muddle. There have been many versions of the theme. As I've shown, some argue the point from the two givings of the law. The first, so they say, was a works covenant, whereas the second was as a rule to those who are in Christ. In the previous chapter, I demonstrated the schizophrenic nonsense this is. But what about Hebrews 8.13 and 9.15? Do these passages have any bearing on the so-called covenant of works said to be given to Adam? Certainly not. When God says he has made a new covenant, and thus, as the writer immediately adds by way of deduction and explanation, he has made the first obsolete, it doesn't mean that after Adam fell, God instituted a new covenant of grace with him. The writer to the Hebrews was not talking about Adam at all. There is not the remotest possibility of it. Why, he doesn't even mention Adam in his entire letter. In Hebrews 8.13, he was not saying that an old covenant with Adam was replaced by a new covenant with Adam. Nor was he declaring that an old covenant with Adam was replaced by a new covenant with Moses. Nor was he saying that an old covenant of grace was replaced by a new covenant of grace. When the writer of the Hebrew spoke of the old covenant, the first covenant which was made old and replaced, he was referring not to Adam and Eden, but to Moses and Sinai. And when speaking of the new covenant, that altogether different covenant, he was not referring to Moses and Sinai, but to Christ and Calvary. He was asserting that the old covenant of Moses, the law, given at Sinai, has been replaced by the new covenant, a grace covenant, made by Christ on Calvary. This is the simple, undeniable, and stubborn and glorious fact about Hebrews 8.13. The entire context of Hebrews is in contestable proof of it. The Puritans, the masters of or mastered by covenant theology, certainly showed confusion over all this. They simply could not agree as to what the New Testament means when it refers to the first and second covenants, the old and new covenants. They couldn't agree as to in their terms, 
they could not agree as to, in their terms, how many covenants of grace there are. In particular, some said the Mosaic covenant was the covenant of works. Others thought it subservient to the covenant of grace. Others a mixed covenant of works and grace. Yet others, the majority, thought it was the covenant of grace. And since the Puritans played and are still playing such an important role in this debate on the law in general and covenant theology in particular, this obvious flaw and glaring confusion, which lies at the very foundation of their case, should give their earnest advocates pause for thought. As covenant theologians have to admit, such divisions and differences of interpretation are discouraging, and so they must be for those who want to follow the Puritans in their views of the law. Perhaps the edifice reform teachers have erected, though outwardly very impressive, might in fact be totally unstable right from the start. Shaky foundations, it seems to me. Covenant theology is confused, right at its heart. Covenant theology is confused, right at its heart. Is the Mosaic covenant the covenant of grace or works, neither or both, or one looking like the other? Is it all to do with the two givings of the law? Is it all a Jewish misunderstanding? Or what? This much is clear. Reformed theologians are able, apparently, to live with this tangle of illogicality. And they seem more than happy to castigate those, the Jews in their time and now me and others like me, who cannot. The truth is, of course, their logic and its conundrums are not found in the covenant of Sinai and have nothing to do with the Jews but are entirely the province of covenant theologians themselves. Let me just... Let me give just one example of the sort of thing I am talking about. Listen to this Reformed writer. The unbelieving Israelites were under the covenant of grace made with their father Abraham externally but under the covenant of works made with their father Adam internally. Further, as to believers among them, they were internally as well as externally under the covenant of grace, and only externally under the covenant of works, and that not as a covenant coordinate with, but subordinate and subservient to the covenant of grace. So said Boston. Did you get it? Did you get it when you listened to that again? Do you think you will ever really get it? I wonder if Boston got it. The consequences did not stop with Israel, of course. Every adherent of covenant theology today has to sort out such matters. That is, if they want to be sure about how they and their offspring stand. Are there infant children in the covenant of grace or works? If they are in the covenant of grace, are they in it externally or internally? I know from sad experience how an unbeliever can rebuff the call of the gospel and push aside its warnings by saying he or his father was in the covenant. I wonder, however, does such an unbeliever know which covenant he is talking about? The question remains, according to Reformed theologians, was the Mosaic covenant the covenant of grace or of works or of grace looking like works or, or what? Since it is fundamental to covenant theology, we have a right to know, surely. I think I have provided evidence enough to justify my claim. Reformed theologians are divided and confused over the Mosaic Covenant. Some think it was the Covenant of Grace. Some think it was the Covenant of Works. Some think it was both. Some think it was the Covenant of Grace looking like the Covenant of Works. In short, 
there is no such thing as the reformed view of the Mosaic covenant. They simply cannot tell. As I've observed, this would not matter so much. But according to their own statements, the covenant of works is pivotal As I have observed, this would not matter so much. But according to their own statements, the covenant of works is pivotal to their system. Even so. If so, and if they cannot decide whether or not the law is the covenant of works, what confidence should others place in their arguments on the believer and the law? Of free Of far greater importance, what does Scripture say about the Mosaic Covenant? Was the law a works covenant? Note, I did not say the covenant of works. I hope I have said enough to make it plain that it was nothing to do with Adam and the reformed notion of the covenant of works. The answer is, of course, the law was a works covenant. After all, the Bible speaks of the works or deeds of the law. But there are two principal passages which prove the point. I refer to Romans 10, 5 to 6, and Galatians 4, 4 to 5. This last I regard as the clinching argument. Proof that the law was a works covenant. 1. Romans 10, 5 to 6. Let me quote the verses. Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. And so on. Paul speaks of two ways of attaining righteousness. The righteousness which is of the law. And the righteousness of faith. But the apostle speaks. But the apostle more than speaks of two ways. But the apostle more than speaks of two ways. He contrasts them. The righteousness which is of the law, but the righteousness of faith. Moreover, Paul contrasts them very strongly. In truth, he opposes them. Justification by law, by works, he sets against justification by grace, through faith. Thus it's clear, the law is a works covenant, opposed to grace. All this has to do with justification, I quite accept the fact. I go further. It's essential for what I want to say. On the question of justification, law and faith, grace, are contrasted. I stress this once again, even though it is obvious, and for the same reason as before. Namely, some teachers want us to believe that law and grace go hand in hand. As a matter of fact, some of them, it seems to me, see hardly any difference between the two. And some say they are one in the same. Clearly they are not. But there's an even bigger point to be made. To which law was Paul referring? The passage, of course, has very close links with Galatians 3.12. Paul quoted Leviticus 18.5 in both places. The law in question, therefore, is the Mosaic law. The upshot, the law of Moses was a works covenant. The law of Moses, I stress. All of it. This is not the only place where justification is linked with obedience to the law. The doers of the law will be justified. True, because of sin, the commandment which was to bring life brought death, cursing those under it, and therefore by the deeds of the law no flesh will be justified. Consequently, a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. No one is justified by the law. The law is not a faith. Yes, all this is true, but the fact that Paul needed to say it shows 
that perfect obedience would have earned salvation. Paul would never have needed to make such statements, nor written Romans 4, Ephesians 2, or Philippians 3, if law and justification had not been linked. The law required works, which, if accomplished, would have earned salvation. Note the connection between the law, the doing of the law. Note the various doing words such as practice, do, obey, deeds, works, keep. And life, eternal life, in Leviticus 18, Ezekiel 20, Matthew 19, Luke 10, Luke 18, Romans 2, and Romans 10, for instance. The law, if kept perfectly, would have merited salvation. Indeed, in one case the law was kept, and justification was earned by Christ for his people, Galatians 4. If perfect law-keeping could not have brought righteousness, then Christ could never have earned salvation for his people through the law, Galatians 4. This is the bigger point I noted a moment ago. The man Christ Jesus, and only the man Christ Jesus, has attained life by keeping the law. This is the point. Perfect obedience to the law brought the reward because the law demanded works and promised righteousness for obedience. It is the core of Paul's argument in Romans 4 and Romans 11. The principle of It is the core of Paul's argument in Romans 4.4 4 and 11.6. The principle applies precisely in Christ's case. Christ coming under the law amounts to far more than saying Jesus was a Jew. Of course, born under the law does mean that Jesus was a Jew, but it means far more than that. When combined with the following verse, the purpose of Christ's coming and his being under the law is spelled out. Christ came to set elect Jews and Gentiles free from being confined and condemned under the law to redeem those who were under the law. Nor must we forget, Paul has already told us that Christ bore the curse of the law in his death, Galatians 3. The curse of the law, I repeat. The curse of the entire Mosaic law. In short, Romans 10, 5-6 proves that the law was a works covenant. Reference to Galatians 4 leads me on to what I have called the clinching passage to prove that the law was a works covenant. Before I come to that, however, let me repeat what I said at the start of this chapter. I realize this section of my book is involved and difficult. At the risk of being wearisome, let me pause to explain once again what I am trying to do. In face of reformed opposition, I am trying to show that the law was a works covenant. It was not the gospel. To this end, I am providing evidence to support my claim that the law promised the Jews justification for perfect obedience. And it really did promise justification. It was not a figment of Jewish imagination. Though, of course, justification by the law was in practice not possible to fallen man, no sinner can keep the law perfect. Perfect obedience to the law would merit justification. That is what the Bible teaches. And this establishes that the law was a works covenant. It was not the gospel. All this has considerable bearing on the way Reformed theology speaks of the so-called covenant of works and what part the law plays in that covenant, itself a pillar of covenant theology, which in turn leads to the idea that sanctification is by the law. And that is why I am tackling it here. Many Puritans, however, were in a muddle over this, even though they could argue that Christ earned and merited and worked righteousness for his people by keeping the law and dying under the curse of God, they also argued that justification could not come by the law. This is true, of course, in the sense... This is true, of course, in the sense that nobody but Christ could or did keep it. But the fact is, perfect obedience to the law would have brought justification. Indeed, 
Christ's perfect obedience did earn righteousness for all his people. Not all Reformed writers give Romans 7.10 its proper weight. Indeed, not all Reformed writers refer to the verse or even quote it in their books on the law. This is very odd, or worse. Since at first glance, it has something to say in contradiction of the Reformed claim that the law was a grace covenant. Now for the clinching passage. Proof that the law was a works covenant. 2. Galatians 4. 4 to 5. Let me quote the verses. When the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. Let us begin by reminding ourselves that a sinner is justified by faith, without the works of the law. Now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Romans 3 As I've shown above, however, perfect obedience to the law would bring justification, but it would have to be perfect. If a man offends in one point, he brings the entire system crashing about his ears, James 2. Paul felt the sting of his breaking the tenth commandment. But in the breaking of the tenth, he broke all the law. Perfect obedience in all points, at every turn, is required. A sinner, therefore... A sinner, therefore who seeks justification by the works of the law, is attempting an utter impossibility. But Jesus Christ, the sinless one, could and did keep the law and thus establish righteousness for the elect. As a consequence, justifying righteousness accomplished by the works of Christ is imputed to the sinner through faith without his work. To him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Therefore, to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Romans 4 and 8. God's law demanded works. Christ provided them. The law demanded perfection. Christ provided it. The law demanded atonement by blood. Christ died as a sin offering under the law, shedding his blood on the cross. By one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. This is what enabled Paul to exclaim, we establish the law. And this is the teaching of Galatians 4. God sent Christ his Son into the world to redeem those who were under the law. Consequently, the Lord Jesus came as a man to redeem men. But not only did the Son of God become human, he became a Jew, which meant he was born under the law, born taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men, so that he might be obedient to death, even the death of the cross, having become a curse for us, cursed by the law, so that he might redeem us from it. What law is this? The same law as throughout Galatians 3, of course. I will deal with this later. 
but for now I summarize the position. Christ was born under the very law which the Jews were under prior to the coming of Christ, that is the Mosaic law. And Christ, by keeping that law, and suffering the curse of that law, redeemed the elect who were under it. In other words, Christ accomplished salvation by works. By the works of the law, he earned it. This can only mean that the law was a works covenant. If not, how did Christ redeem those under the law by going under the law? Would Reformed teachers say Christ was born under what they call the covenant of grace? Was he cursed by the covenant of grace? Some try to avoid this by saying the curse is to do only with the ceremonial law. This distinction is without biblical warrant, as I will show. But allowing the distinction for sake of argument, is the curse attached to this so-called ceremonial law or the law itself? Was Christ made under and cursed under the ceremonial law only? Of course not. Christ came into the world, born a Jew under the law, a works covenant, in order to earn work, deserve and merit salvation for his people. Did he earn it by works under a grace covenant? The answer is self-evident. The believer's righteousness is an earned righteousness, earned by Christ, earned by keeping the law, earned by suffering under the law, but only if the law is a works covenant, which it is. Of course, no sinner could keep the law and so earn salvation. As Horatius Boner put it, not what these hands have done can save this guilty soul. Not what this toiling flesh has borne can make my spirit whole. Not what I feel or do can give me peace with God. Not all my prayers and sighs and tears can bear my awful load. But Christ could and did. And there the believer rests his soul forever. On merit not my own I stand, on doings which I have not done, merit beyond what I can claim, doings more perfect than my own. Upon a life I have not lived, upon a death I did not die, another's life, another's death, I stake my whole eternity. Believers are justified by resting on this finished work of the one who did all the doing which the holy God required under his law. As a result, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. What must I do to be saved is the question. As we've seen, work the law thunders. Keep me perfectly. What does the gospel say? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Trust the Redeemer, who under the law by his works earned salvation. If the law was not a works covenant, if the law was not a works covenant, bang goes our salvation. Think of the precious promise John gives to all believers. We confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It is, I say, precious, but it's more. It's truly amazing, staggering. One would expect John to have said something like, if we confess our sins, God is kind, merciful, loving to forgive us our sins. But he didn't say that. Rather, he spoke of God's faithfulness and justice. Why did he say that God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins? Faithful? Just? The answer is, of course, God is faithful and just to forgive us. He is not only kind to forgive us. It is his faithfulness and justice which demand and ensure forgiveness. Why? Because Christ has earned it. Because Christ has merited it. In that great 
eternal agreement of which I spoke at the beginning of this chapter. God demanded obedience, promising life for that of perfect obedience. Do and live was the essence of God's commandment and promise. It's impossible for God to affirm black is white. He cannot acquit the wicked. I will not justify the wicked. To do so would be to break his own law. He who justifies the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. But he must justify the righteous. Just as he cannot justify the wicked, so he must justify the righteous. He can only justify it on the basis of righteousness, on the basis of work, on the basis of merit, on the basis of perfect obedience. And all this Christ freely accepted in that agreement made within the God in eternity past. And so in time, at the appointed time, having come into the world, having been made under the law, <coughs> And so, in time, at the appointed time, having come into the world, having been made under the law, Christ died under the law in order to accomplish this eternal purpose of God. Christ said, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Let me emphasize that. Christ did not come to destroy the law or the prophets. That is to invalidate, to represent us of no authority or of diminished authority, those former revelations of the divine law. In addition to not invalidating the law, Christ did not destroy it, demolish it, dismantle it, or repeal it. For as I will show later, the law now plays the role of a paradigm in the believer's sanctification. Rather, speaking of the law in particular, Christ came to fulfill it. That is, he came in order to obey it to the full and complete it. This he did to the letter, to the jot, and to the tittle. In keeping this works covenant in its entirety, he merited the everlasting salvation of all his people. Wait a moment, says an objector. Look at Romans 4, 5. God who justifies the ungodly. How can this be reconciled with what you have just said? You have been arguing that justification under the law comes by works. How then can God justify the ungodly, since no ungodly person can produce the necessary law works? What is the answer, the explanation? Just this. Romans 4, 5 is speaking about justification under the gospel, not the law. And this is the gospel. Christ came under the old covenant and kept the law, thus earning the salvation of the elect, earning it by his work. This is the principle that Christ came under. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as according to grace, but as of debt. This is the principle that Christ came under. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as according to grace, but as debt. Christ obtained redemption for the elect, earning it, not by grace. Earning grace are a contradiction in terms but by his law works, in order to grant it by grace to the elect upon their believing, that they might be justified freely by God's grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. In this way, God justifies the ungodly. That is, justifies him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. He did this that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. But this justification had to be earned by law work. Under the gospel, God justifies the sinner who does not do the work, who cannot do the work. When the sinner trusts the Christ who, under the law, did the work.
Christ did all this in perfect obedience to the will of his Father. Christ came into the world with the express purpose of saving sinners in order to complete the work given him by the Father. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. To the Jews, he said, I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. He could speak of the works which the Father has given me to finish the very works that I do. These works included the miracles, yes, but above all they included the work of salvation. The Lord Jesus could say to the Father, I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And above all, his final shout of triumph on the cross, it is finished, it is accomplished. This is the gospel, God's eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In the person and work of Christ, God and above all, his final shout of triumph on the cross, it is finished, it is accomplished. This is the gospel, God's eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In the person and work of Christ, God can declare, it pleased the Lord for the sake of his righteousness to make his law great and glorious. Christ was born a Jew and lived under the Mosaic law. He obeyed the Mosaic law. He was cursed under the law. In all this, Christ established and magnified the law. He honored his father in the law and in so doing merited the salvation of his people. Amazing grace, indeed. Thus, while forgiveness is an act of God's grace towards the sinner, is based entirely and only upon the merit, the work, the obedience of Christ. God, therefore, is faithful and just to forgive the one who believes and confesses his sin. Why? Because if God did not, he would be unjust. He would be unfaithful. He would fail to keep his promise. Unthinkable, impossible. Under the law, he promised life upon obedience. It was the will of God that Christ should come under the law, obey it, keep it, and fulfill it. This demand Christ met. As a consequence, when the sinner cries out to God through faith in Christ, trusting the person, merit, and work of Christ, God must forgive. Do not misunderstand me when I say must. Very near the start of this chapter, I reminded you that God who cannot lie promised before time began, promised the Son that he would justify all the elect on the basis of the Son's obedience. And since God has promised, he has tied himself to his word. And because he has tied himself to his promised word, God must keep his promise. He remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. This is the must. Under the law, he said, do this and live. Christ did the doing, and God keeps his promise. All this proves that the law was a works covenant, a very different covenant to the new covenant. Not only that, it means that the two testaments, though having a certain continuity, are discontinuous. In short, not only are Calvin's second and third uses of the law wrong, but so is the covenant theology on which those uses are defended and argued. A few Reformed theologians have seen this. The covenant theology needs correction, modification, and explanation, even recasting, has been admitted by some Reformed teachers. John Murray, for one. I would go further. Recasting? Rejecting more like. Sadly, however, most Reformed theologians do not seem willing even to think. Sadly, however, most Reformed theologians do not seem willing even to rethink or recast their covenant theology, but have instead developed a system of, of 
Sadly, however, most Reformed theologians do not seem willing even to rethink or recast their covenant theology, but have instead developed a system of escape routes to get round awkward passages of Scripture. To these escape routes, I now turn.